topic we have been assigned by Reverend Sandy is transformation. <coughs> it's a big topic and there's lots of different ways we could go. So let me outline a game plan for today. Let's talk about transformation of consciousness, which is really where all trans lasting transformation begins. Then, as an example of how to get there, I'd like to review The Golden Key by Emmett Fox. And then, a story from the Hebrew Scriptures with metaphysical interpretation. And then, a story from the Christian Scriptures with metaphysical interpretation. And then, a recap. Sound like a game plan? Yeah. All right. So let's start by admitting all lasting transformation happens first in consciousness. We can try and change outer conditions, but it's only going to be temporary unless there is first a causative transformation in consciousness. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven consciousness and right thinking, and all these outer things will be added to you. And it says in Proverbs, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it's a combination of the thinking and the heart that produces the transformation. Reverend Sandy talked about this topic last week, of the mind and the heart have to work together. One way to look at it is as the mind provides the mold for the change we want, and the feelings provide the divine substance that fills the mold. Or another metaphor would be uh, to use the slide projection. Our mind holds up the picture of what we want, and the feeling or faith part provides the light that shines through that slide and projects it into manifestation. In unity, the formula for creation or transformation is mind, idea, manifestation. That's Unity 101. Mind, idea, manifestation. And the rhyming couplet is ideas held in mind manifest after their kind. So I'll say it again and then we can try it together. Ideas held in mind manifest after their kind. Ready? Ideas held in mind manifest after their kind. Unity 101. This is the secret of transformation. And Joel Goldsmith, the New Thought author and speaker, has said, ultimately, we have nothing to work on but our own consciousness. This is the source of all change or transformation. All right, on to excerpts from The Golden Key by Emmett Fox, because I think he talks about how to get to this transformative state um, as well as anyone. So, here we go. Scientific prayer is the golden key to harmony and happiness. Try it for yourself. God is omnipotent, and we are God's image and likeness. The ability to draw on his power is not the special prerogative of the mystic or the saint. Everyone has this ability. This is because in scientific prayer, it is God who works and not you. You are only the channel through which divine action takes place, and your treatment will be just the getting yourself out of the way. As for the actual method of working, like all fundamental things, it is simplicity itself. All you have to do is this. Stop thinking about the difficulty, whatever it is, and think about God instead. That Emmett Fox, what a pistol. I tell you, he was a straight shooter, and he didn't suffer fools gladly. 
His background was in electrical engineering, and he thought spiritual laws were like electrical laws. Very simple and straightforward. This is the cause, this is the result. Do this, get this. So, to continue. It never fails to work when given a fair chance. Work by rehearsing anything or everything that you know about God. God is wisdom, truth, inconceivable love. God is present everywhere, has infinite power, knows everything, and so on. The rule is to think about God. You must think about God and nothing else. At first, it may be difficult to get your thoughts away from material things. Constantly repeating a statement of absolute truth, such as, there is no power but God, I am the child of God, God is guiding me now, or perhaps best and simplest of all, God is with me. Be quiet but insistent. Each time you find your attention wandering, switch it back to God. Leave the question of ways and means to God. You do your half, and God will never fail to do God's. So it's developing this God consciousness all the time that leads to change and transformation. This is Unity's fourth principle. Through prayer and meditation, we develop our consciousness of divine oneness. It's a constant practice. Another section uh, by Emma Fox, this is from around the year with Emma Fox, one of my all-time favorites. Um, and this is about the transformative power of prayer. Prayer, she says, does change things. He says, prayer does change things. Let us be perfectly clear about this. Many people say that prayer mm, is a good thing because it gives us courage and fortitude for meeting our troubles. They say that prayer often gets a man out of difficulty simply by giving himself confidence that he would have otherwise lacked. Of course, this is not spiritual truth. The fact is that seeing the presence of God where the trouble seems to be does not merely give us courage to meet the trouble. It changes the trouble into harmony. Prayer heals the body by changing the tissues, and it does this by first changing the mind that forms them. Prayer brings man to salvation by changing his nature fundamentally, not by taking him as he is. So, there you have it. Thank you, Emmett Fox. It's through prayer and meditation we can bring about these changes. All right. On to Hebrew scriptures with metaphysical interpretation. Are you ready? We are going to go to Joshua chapter 6, which describes the battle of Jericho as the Israelites are entering the promised land for the first time. This is their first battle. And here we go. <clears throat> now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one went in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have handed Jericho over to you, along with its king and soldiers. You shall march about the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. When they shall make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. So the Israelites do this the first few days. They make the circle around the city. It's the soldiers and the priests blowing the ram's horn, and the Ark of the Covenant, and all of the people following. Then the seventh day. 
On the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown, and the wall fell down flat. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. They burned down the city and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Well, what a dramatic uh, entrance into the promised land. So, considering a little uh, interpretation here. Well, first, this battle was not a military battle by any means. It was a spiritual battle. The instructions from the Lord were not to surround and lay siege to the city. It was not to build catapults to throw flaming balls of pitch over the ramparts. It was not to construct ladders to scale the walls to capture the fortress that way. It was all about worshiping the Lord and acknowledging the Lord. And as Henry Fox said, taking their mind off of the problem and putting it on the Lord. In Zechariah, the Lord says, Not by might, not by power, but I, my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And in Exodus, we read, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord shall fight for you, and you will hold your peace. So, sometimes it's hard to stand still and hold our peace when we're facing something like a walled city standing in our way. Um, I think that a walled city is a good metaphor for the seemingly impregnable difficulties we may face in our lives sometimes, whether individually, as a church, as a nation. Looking at what uh, Charles Fulmer says about this story. He says, Joshua represents Jehovah is the victory. Well, yeah, duh. Jehovah is always the victory. And he says that Jericho represents the intellect as opposed to spirit. So whatever difficulties the intellect may make, the spirit can overcome them. And I think every time our intellect has a negative thought about a situation or a negative feeling about a situation, it's like we're adding stones onto the wall and making the fortress more impregnable. Charles Fillmore also says the ram's horns represent denial of adverse conditions and affirmation of the power of spirit. Of course, blowing the horns is probably a good way to clear their minds and we know that singing and chanting and music are a good way to drive out negative feelings and instill positive ones. We want to bring all our thoughts under the dominion of our Christ mind. Charles Fillmore also says the Ark of the Covenant that they carried around Jericho and represent the presence of God um, or our awareness of the presence of God. Back to unity principle number four the realization that spirit is the real self of us. Now, um, in entering the promised land here, in entering into Canaan, the children of Israel had been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, and they were finally ready to enter the promised land. And this is what uh, Charles Fillmore says about entering the promised land, the spiritual equivalent. We command our thought world to harmonize with divine standards and transform into an entirely new state of consciousness. So he's talking about transformation of consciousness, is entering into the promised land. All right, on to a similar story from the Christian scriptures. This is going to be uh, Jesus healing the daughter of Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. This is from uh, Mark chapter 5. 
One of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So Jesus went with him. Some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Fear not, believe only. When they came to the home of the leader of the synagogue, Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Again, not a physical battle, but a spiritual one. Charles Fillmore says, Jairus represents the individual receiving enlightenment from spirit. And here we find Jairus turning to the Christ for enlightenment, for success, for happiness, for abundance. Metaphysically, what might the daughter represent? What could be more cherished than a child, than a daughter? For us, there could be any cherished hope or ideal, a relationship, a dream, that perhaps the world sees as dead. But when we turn to the Christ, it's never too late. It's fascinating that to do the healing, well, first of all, when the people came and said the child is dead, Jesus ignored them. He turned to the Father and he said, Fear not, only believe. Because it was the Father's faith that was going to produce the miracle. And therefore, it was important that the Father's faith not doubt. In Genesis 18 14, it says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is there any problem that is greater than the Lord? <clears throat> so, let's recap briefly. So we have all transformation basically happens in consciousness. We have a golden key for thinking about affirming through prayer and meditation our divine oneness. We see in Jericho the power of spirit to affect transformation. And the story of Jairus is one of faith. In the Christ. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of heaven consciousness and right thinking, and all these things shall be added to you. He said, Fear not, only believe. And lastly, we know that the will of God for us is always life more abundant, because Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This is